Chernobyl Reactor 4 is now a nuclear bomb. Oh, really? <laughs> Welcome back to the Chernobyl series. Today we're going to be looking at the series finale, episode 5. This episode kind of goes back and forth between right before the accident, during the accident, and the trial after the accident set over a year later. Let's check it out. In 100, I'll go home, get some sleep, come back tonight. We'll proceed then. I'll personally supervise the test. This should be the first sign that this is an error likely situation. They are changing the timeline of the test and having this supervisor here roll tonight. I hated it when that happens <laughs> in real life. Trying to time certain things only for it to roll the nights and getting prepared for something in order to have it not happen on your shift. This, this sort of thing happens, um, for instance, when you're at a refueling outage, you wanna, you're want to you manning the place 24-7 and you're trying to proceed onward with, uh, with the schedule of the project. So if things pull to the left or push to the right, that's going to change the uh, timeline for this. So to get around this, there should be a day shift crew and a night shift crew prepared to do this test. But manager observations of a certain test, like what this guy is doing, that is annoyingly realistic. <laughs> and it still happens today. Having to change your own sleep schedule just to see something can be quite annoying. I personally had to do that as part of my training. Also, this guy actually kind of looks like someone I used to work with. This next scene is at the trial. Are accused of violating Article 220, Section 2 of the Criminal Code of the Soviet Union. Now, criminal charges. This is not unique to the Soviet Union. In the U.S., you can face criminal charges for willful non-adherence to technical specifications and the site's procedures. As the technical specifications in the United States are the law from the United States federal government. Um, so yeah, you can face criminal charges. You can also face harsh civil penalties as well. This all depends on severity. Chernobyl, if something like this were to occur in the United States, this would be at the highest level. Note that the Three Mile Island accident was not nearly as bad as Chernobyl. Attacked by a foreign enemy, if there's no power, the pumps cannot move water through the core. In the power plant I worked at, the reactor would automatically shut itself down on a loss of off-site power, and we would enter a procedure to cool down the plant safely. That's actually a pretty easy scenario to do in real life. And without water, the core overheats, the fuel melts down, in short. And you can cool down the plant using natural circulation, that is to say, when the pumps turn off. It takes longer, but it is very doable. Naval submarine reactors do this sort of thing all the time to say stealthy since the pumps actually make a lot of noise. The backup generators took approximately one minute to reach the speed required. Those are really bad diesels. My plant's diesels are designed to start within 10 seconds. And also one minute being too slow means the plant can't stay for one minute without. That's that's not not much margin at all and it's not like those diesels didn't exist back then but they probably had some budget cuts or maybe the soviets didn't have access to better diesels who knows if the dying turbine could keep the pumps working long enough to bridge the 60 second gap now in principle that would work but that would do you no good against an electrical fault that trips the generator as in not the turbine a massive disruption of grid in this um, attack scenario that they're talking about where presumably whoever is attacking the Soviet Union would, would disrupt the grid. That can force a generator trip. Also, that would make the non-nuclear part, the turbine of the, of the nuclear plant, safety related. Something like that would never get approved now in any country. Better diesels is still a better solution for that reason. Why was this delay so dangerous? It created two problems. One of them is scientific in nature, the other is very human. So the scientific problem first, um, it is a uh, xenon buildup within the uh, reactor. So one common fission product of uranium-235 is xenon-135. 
Xenon 135, as I explained in episode 4, is a poison that absorbs neutrons, slowing down the fission and ultimately lowering reactor power. Every time you lower reactor power naturally, it causes a spike in xenon. Unless xenon is being burned out, because when xenon absorbs a neutron, it turns into xenon-136, which doesn't have that same poison um, characteristic. So you're not, you're not in equilibrium anymore, and it's going to lower reactor power. This is another reason why you don't want to operate a nuclear power plant under a load-follow condition. They're great for base load. Less so for load follow, because if you're constantly making changes in power level, you're going to be fighting uh, xenon peaks and valleys. Let's check in on our operating crew. He says to follow the cross-down instructions. So then why are they crossed down? Ooh, that has bad idea written all over it. Field changes to a testing procedure of this magnitude would not actually be allowed in certain conditions, like Safety tests, for instance, which are in according with the technical specifications. It has to go through a huge procedural review process. I've never seen a field change or pen and ink change on any of these sort of testing procedures throughout my career. It, you just, it needs to be vetted properly, one, to see that it's still safe to do this test, and two, they don't want to invalidate the test results by modifying the procedure. You want the plant to be able to take credit for all of the safety tests that they can do. And last but not least, at least just print out a new page to make it easier to read and have the operators follow the procedure. 25 years old, and his total experience on the job, four months. Ooh, yeah, that's, uh, hmm. So the guy being untrained in addition to his very junior amount of experience. All operations at my nuclear power plant control room require a peer checker. All reactivity operations, including changing power levels or manipulation of control rods, require the peer checker and supervisory oversight. In addition, if this, um, if this guy on, was on my crew, um, I would assign him a mentor and a development plan just to make sure he's properly trained and brought up to speed. And that is under normal conditions. Under a special test such as this, we will have additional oversight me measures. We would bring in more operators into the control room. I would also specifically request an operator that has done this test before recently, and we would practice this test in the simulator. I would probably have a young four-month experienced uh, reactor operator act as a shadow, watch the reactivity manipulations take place, and then have him perform them under close observations. After all, I want him to get developed and get good at his job too. I would also ask several intrusive questions, not to sound nitpicky, but to gleam information from the task owner being the, the reactor operator if he could do the test safely, such as, when's the last time you've done this test? Are you under any stress? What sort of things can go wrong with this test? What is your contingency plan if things do go wrong? Again, not to frighten, but I want to ensure the concerns of these reactor operators are adequately addressed before we start. If we can't get them addressed, then we don't do the test. It's that simple. Uranium fuel. As uranium atoms split apart, and collide, reactivity goes up. I have to applaud the show on this. This is an excellent way to explain reactivity coefficients to a lay person. I don't know the details of the trial in real life, and this was probably mainly done for this show, but that is very good. For both copyright and legibility reasons, I have reproduced his explanation. Um, I also did my best guess using Google Translate of transposing the Cyrillic to English. So he starts listing it. He starts with nuclear fission. That one's obvious, so the red ones are positive reactivity. Fission, you can't have a reactor without nuclear fission. He also mentions the void coefficient is positive, and that's, this is probably one of the more infamous aspects of Chernobyl design. What that means is you increase the number of voids, which is steam. Um, so the RBMK reactor is a type of boiling water reactor, so you have steam 
and water within the reactor vessel, you increase the amount of steam, reactor power is going to go up according to this type of design. Void coefficient was negative at the uh, pressurized water reactor and most other reactors in the world <laughs> today. He also did nu wrote nuclear fission a second time just to illustrate relative magnitude. And a negative example, control rods. You put the control rods in, the control rods absorb the neutrons and instead of uranium, so it's going to slow down the amount of fissions. Cool water takes heat out of the system. So I want to clarify what he said about water. Water is indeed a negative reactivity coefficient, and he is referring to the heating up of water. Water can act as a moderator of neutrons, slowing them down to cause more fissions. But when the water heats up, water molecules are further apart, reducing the odds of actually slowing down the neutrons. So that's what he's referring to. When the coolant heats up, it actually lowers the amount of, of reactivity in the core. When I, and when I say reactivity, just think of it as acceleration. Negative reactivity, power's going down. Positive reactivity, reactivity's going up. This is a good thing, as when reactor coolant temperature rises, the reactor basically calms itself down, stabilizing it out. This is actually the dominant type of reactivity coefficient used in a pressurized water reactor that I worked at. That's not the case with RBMKs though, and we'll go on to explain more in a bit. But I put parentheses MTC, it's called the moderator temperature coefficient in most light water reactors, such as the uh, pressurized water reactor that I worked at. It's not really called that in this case, uh, it, for an RBMK because graphite is the moderator, but the physics don't really change. It just has a lesser overall effect for RBMK reactors than it does to pressurize water reactors. The negative temperature coefficient. So this negative temperature coefficient, I just want to be clear that this is of the actual fuel itself. Now the fuel temperature coefficient uses a bit of a different mechanic called uh, Doppler broadening. All you really need to know is as the fuel gets hotter, it slows down the reaction. This is probably one of the most important coefficients in all of nuclear physics just because it enables a reaction to be controlled. If, it, if this thing was positive, it would be a lot more difficult to control a nuclear reactor. But fortunately, this is one of the fundamental properties of nuclear fuel. So it's a natural built-in feedback mechanism that we have nuclear reactor could lead to an explosion I don't blame you after all you don't work in the control room of a nuclear power plant well I did and in my plant there was never any risk of explosion under any conditions but it was he's talking about operating at low power it kind of sucks it isn't dangerous at least not in a modern reactor but things do have a larger effect at a smaller uh, percentage of power. Just think of adjustments being more coarse. Every control rod movement, for instance, has a larger effect uh, one way or the other. It is actually a bigger deal for things in the secondary or non-nuclear part of the plant because everything at nuclear is just stay at 100% is your optimal state and in any other conditions is just you stay there just long enough to ramp up to 100% or to uh, go down from 100% for a planned shutdown. As a response to just being in low power, again, we have more operators in the control room. We, we train, uh, we do refresher just-in-time training for, um, for outage crews for bringing uh, the reactor back up in power um, safely and, and relatively quickly. It's the power. I won't do it. It isn't safe. So if I say it's safe, it's safe. And if the two of you disagree, then you don't yeah. have to work here. This guy is awful. I, I would hate to work for him. And if he worked for him and me, I would have fired him a long time ago. Blatant, this guy is a blatant disrespect for nuclear safety and his crew. This procedure has already cut in a lot of margin as it was written. And they're deviating from it even more. The toilet. Of course he says he wasn't the there. That's how bad of a guy this guy is. The xenon poisoning is so strong, the best they can do is raise the power to 200 megawatts. 
Nice. So Legosov showing his chart of where the conditions were right before the accident happened. So here's he showing the conditions with reactor power sagging. Note only one, only one nuclear fission and the uh, steam void having collapsed. That coefficient goes away, the, pos the positive uh, void coefficient. Just to show, again, it technically doesn't go away, but I love the way they did it in the show because they just showed the relative magnitude here. He goes ahead and adds xenon poisoning twice, which, hey, they did a, they did a quite a sizable down power from 100 all the way to 200 megawatts. So we're talking like 20... 20 to 22 percent. I think this was rated at about a thousand megawatt. This was rated at about a thousand megawatts total, so that's going to be about 20 percent power. They're ba they're basically almost shut themselves down at this point. 211 rods, only six. That is insane. Um, there is an international reactor operator standard that says do not pull control rods while in a transient. The safest thing for them to do at this point is to trip the reactor or the AZ-5 button. They do that later when it's too late, but it, it still would have worked right around this this time period. Um, but when, when you lose control of a reactor, you shut it down. In a reactor trip, at least in a modern nuclear reactor, it does it shuts the thing down in less than two seconds. That places it in a safe condition. If they would have recognized it earlier, then it would have worked and there would be no accident. None of them know what is about to happen. He's referring to the people outside of the control room. That's another thing that would never happen. Whenever you do a special test, advance notice is set out, preferably days or weeks in advance. And just before, multiple public address announcements are done. Just before the test, every 30 minutes during the test, and when the test is over, giving everyone an all clear. So they're talking about their computer system here. So computer systems in the Soviet Union's in the 1980s lagged by several minutes, when seconds counting. They're better off just reading the analog gauges at this point, because they're still pretty quick, even for back then. Also, if safety systems were not defeated as part of this test, the reactor would have shut itself down a long time ago by now. In a modern nuclear reactor, there are also electrical and mechanical interlocks that prevent you from withdrawing control rods too much, in addition to several other conditions that they put themselves in that would not be allowed. He's showing basically the tender box here. He wrote nuclear fission a bunch of times, brought the voltage coefficients back on his chart. Yeah. Um, one thing I would add to take it even further is the increased fission rate of reactor power coming up will actually burn out the xenon more quickly. Remember what I said about xenon-135 absorbing a neutron and turning into xenon-136? And the xenon-136 doesn't absorb many more neutrons, so... Everything is gone at this point. One other thing, when they used the uh, control rods, the geometry was being altered so much by all these uh, power peaks that the control rods actually jammed when they fell in and ultimately tried to trip the reactor at this point. So you're dealing with an overpower and fuel imbalance. What didn't help was that it also took the control rods 20 seconds as opposed to two seconds to reach the bottom of the core. Graphite tips, and when they do, the reaction in the core, which had been rising, skyrockets. Yes, they put the thing that moderates and increase the rate of fissions on the thing that shuts down the reactor. Probably one of the worst design flaws of all time. Chernobyl Reactor 4 is now a nuclear bomb. Oh, really? <laughs> No, just, no. He was doing so good. Not, it's, it's not a nuclear bomb. The fuel is completely different type. But I do get what he's saying. He is referring to prompt criticality. And they had so much positive reactivity and such little negative reactivity at this point. Hence the chart. He removed all the blue stuff. That, yeah. Um, the, the prompt criticality condition was there. Now, what prompt criticality is, is prompt neutrons 
show up almost instantaneously. We're talking 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Those typically don't create a self-sustaining nuclear fission reaction by itself. Um, you have delayed neutrons, which show up seconds later. So fast enough that, you know, people and systems, systems can react. I mean, it keeps itself, it keeps itself sta stable normally. That is called delayed critical. Prompt critical is when those, there's enough prompt neutrons to sustain the fission reaction by itself. So it's like instantaneously power just skyrockets. That is the principal design behind a nuclear bomb. So that part he's right about when he makes the comparison to a nuclear bomb, but you don't have the fuel enrichment and you don't have the geometry of orienting the fuel in such a position that it would create a nuclear bomb. So I guess another way of referring to this would be a nuclear comma bomb. It's a nuclear and it blows itself up, but nothing like a uh, like the nuclear bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima, for instance. Explosion. So yeah, the explosion started out due to steam buildup. The first one ruptured the fuel. The second, much more massive one that you see here, was from the buildup in the hydrogen, which interact with oxygen, like you said, and it blew up. Well, hey, at least the reactor's shut down now because it's in pieces. And hey, the rest is history. Let's look at the aftermath slides that they show at the end of the show. So the Soviets actually made modifications to RBMK reactors. Some of them were more control rods, absorbers to, to limit um, operation at low power, and uh, the, the power peaking I mentioned earlier just to create a more even uh, fuel distribution. Reactor trip um, speed went upgraded from 20 seconds to 12 seconds. That's, that's still pretty bad, <laughs> but it's, it's an improvement. Um, hard mechanical interlocks against defeating safety systems, so no one would ever try something stupid like this again. Another one was increased enrich enrichment. That's just more, that's more of a fuel utilization type upgrade rather than a safety related upgrade. Uh, this whole, this whole baby thing, silliness. So they, they admit that they made it up? What? Well, then why, ugh, then why put that in the show? <laughs> Ugh. Well, that bridge, that is pure fiction right there on the bridge. So, I don't know if this is true, but there, I did find an article, I'll link it, about that this whole bridge of death thing. Well, I knew that it's definitely a myth, but allegedly there was a motorcycle accident on something where someone, someone died just being off doing something crazy on that bridge, and that's why they called it the bridge of death, but... I don't know how true that, that part is, but yeah, this whole bridge of death, pure fiction. So on the note of the miners, um, this, this might be true, I don't actually know, but there are some confounding variables here, because many miners in the Soviet Union didn't really live very long, because mining by itself is dangerous and likely to cause cancers. To say it was just from Chernobyl alone probably doesn't tell the whole story. So, Chernobyl certainly didn't help. Okay, so, so good, they acknowledge this. This is referring to the three people on that alleged suicide mission at the end of episode two. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad they mentioned that um, they actually survived. That's good. All right, now on to deaths. 4,000 to 93,000 deaths. Huh. Let's look and see how many people really died from Chernobyl. So the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Association, says two people died during the initial explosion, 28 more people died within three months due to acute radiation exposure, probably one of the most horrific ways to die. And 50 to 60 people total is what they estimate died decades later after the event. Now, the UN did a study in 2005 to 2006 to look more at the uh, cancer deaths. They estimate 4,000 people died from cancer, so I can at least see where the, the HBO series got their smaller number from. But this is through 2065, and they use the controversial linear no-threshold model. So what does that mean? Well, 
There's a lot of ways to measure the uh, dose from radiation. So this chart, 100 millisieverts, as it shows there, is the lowest dose where excess cancer has been observed. The linear no threshold model, the blue line, assumes there is no threshold and every bit of radiation dose you get above background increases your risk of cancer. There's some different models out there too, uh, like the hormesis model, which basically shows a little bit's good for you. That's not something the nuclear industry uses. <laughs> but yeah, the linear no threshold model assumes there's no... Um, there's no threshold at all. So the threshold model, the purple dash line, is probably closest to um, what's more widely um, acceptable. It's a very conservative means of uh, measuring, to, uh, to say the least. In other words, every banana you eat, because bananas are radioactive, and every time you cuddle your partner, you, uh, <laughs> you get that much closer to getting cancer, according to the linear no threshold model. So this is a very conservative highball, this 4,000 number. And so using these sort of sources, I mean, they probably should have put like between 50 to 4,000, um, or maybe they could have said experts estimate as high as 4,000, but that 90, that 90,000 number, I don't know where they're getting that sort of thing from. I, I suppose you can extrapolate for uh, from this already extrapolation through through 2065 based on this this UN study. I'm just not sure how you get to 90,000 unless you do something like this. Looking at indirect deaths, so fossil fuels are by far the deadliest way to produce electricity. Um, this is per terawatt hour, which is a good bit of energy that has been produced. Coal is by far the deadliest. Over 10,000 terawatt hours per year for coal worldwide. So you do the math, over 200,000 people die per year from coal. Now, if we assume 1% of all of our coal production is due to fear of nuclear from Chernobyl and Three Mile Island and later Fukushima, then that would get us up to 2,000 deaths per year from Chernobyl based on fear. And that would get you to over 70,000 deaths since 1986. And yes, I'm very aware of the flaws of using something like this. I just wanted to do a quick uh, back of the envelope thought to see how you would possibly get to the tens of thousands of deaths on a Chernobyl death toll. And... I don't think this is what the show did, but it would be it would be interesting because of how much fear Chernobyl has caused. And keep in mind, this is just one percent, and this is just from coal, so this is by no means meant to be accurate. But it's just kind of a little, like I said, a thought experiment. Let me know what you think of this, and also if you can intrigue me as to where they got the ninety-one thousand figure from. That's this is, this is the only way I could think you can get that high. I saw some pretty crazy sources out there, but they weren't um, part of my regularly accepted sources, such as the IAEA or, or, or the UN. Now, as far as to what I thought of this episode, this was by far my favorite one. It, since it talked about the operations crew, I, I love um, the uh, operations aspect of nuclear power. And not counting that little epilogue slideshow, this was by far the most accurate, um, which was fascinating to me because reactor physics isn't something that's very well known, but the show did a better job with their reactor physics explanation than they did with their health effects of radiation by a lot, which is weird because everyone in the medical field and like most hospitals know about the health effects of of radiation so that one's not as out there as far as knowledge to go by i wonder why they did it if they would have made all of the episodes like episode five this would have been a much better series but i still wonder why there's that there's that disconnect maybe you can share some some insight if you have if you happen to know but episode five uh chernobyl i Started off not really liking the series that much, but I will say they, they ended on a high note. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.